line from New York City, uh, architect George Rinaldi and his wife partner Anne Valentino uh, will discuss their architecture. Uh, George is a renowned New York-based architect who founded his practice in 1977 and has a long academic career as well uh, as a professor at Yale and later Dean of the City College of Architecture. Uh, and uh, is a specialized neuropsychologist and a professor and uh, is involved in, uh, I guess, the behavioral science and architecture with the firm. So thank you so much for being with us. We were uh, introduced to you by Oscar Vieira Ojeda, who has published a number of your uh, books on your architecture. And uh, it's a real thrill for us to be with you. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas, very much. We're really thrilled and pleased to be here and to um, uh, present our, our work and our research uh, to you and your audience. So I think we'll, <clears throat> at this point, begin. So in 1977, I established George Rinaldi Architect as an independently owned, full service architecture business. And I set out to make great architecture. Since its humble beginnings nearly 45 years ago, the company has evolved into a successful interdisciplinary architecture and design firm based in New York City with branch offices in Columbia County, New York and Orange County, California with projects in New York State and other states and across the world. So we continue to be self-funded and we're actively self-managed. We've never brought in outside financing. And since the early days, this kind of independence has given us the opportunity to reimagine professional practice. Although we started out as an architecture business and the core competency of the company is still architecture, our focus has expanded over the years, which also helps us make really great architecture. By erasing the artificial distinctions between architecture, design, sustainability, urbanism, planning, graphic design, industrial design, and so on, our portfolio uh, has grown rich with solutions for complex projects completed on budget and on schedule. George Rinaldi Architect has developed a unique way of doing things that we hope you enjoy hearing about as much as learning about some of our projects. Our executive team is made up uh, of a registered architect and lead designer and a social scientist and licensed psychologist. By integrating architecture and social science, we have come to understand that truisms about human behavior and about design are proven wrong surprisingly often. And it is best to practice in ways that can be measured, analyzed, and learned from. So we're guided by our core values of history, craft, and invention. As we've expanded our focus and diversified, we're an architecture firm that's also a historic preservation and adaptive reuse firm, a master planning firm, exhibition design firm, industrial design firm, and more. The underlying constant, no matter what we're doing though, is the integration of the logic of modernist architecture with the contextual reality of existing setting, settings to create an iconic design of intriguing abstraction that's able to weather shifting currents of style. As a lifelong learning firm, we believe in the importance of innovation as much as the craft traditions to the building arts. And although this was an unconventional approach years ago, the idea has caught on and our projects have accrued honors and awards for striking modern design attuned to the nuances of historical, cultural, social, and personal resources. Ann Valentino, locally referred to here as Dr. V, joined the firm in 1985 on the client services side, supporting nonprofit projects and training programs while simultaneously running her own clinical psychology practice and industrial organizational psychology consulting business. Beginning about 20 years ago, Dr. V defined a unique kind of leadership role at the architectural firm where behavioral science plays a major part in all the professional services we offer and in the advancement of our core values of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So the most common question we tend to get asked is, how did the two of you decide what projects to work on? 
And the simple answer is that one of us usually decides and then has to convince the other. But we're equally inclined to say that neither of us can possibly be right often enough for an entire company to operate successfully. So everyone else's ideas and decisions, our workforce and our colleagues in engineering, science and the arts are welcomed and subject to the same level of scrutiny as ours. The ideals of modernist architecture summed up in the old adage, form follows function, which is central to modernist purity, pursuit of the purity of form, led to the wholesale rejection of historic, vernacular, and cultural references, and instead embraced repetition and mass production, thought to have a positive impact on social progress. However, modernist architecture failed to deliver on its promise. And we think the greatest failure is that it has deprived us of the hopefulness of its own ideals. And instead, it has left us with places that people dislike, find depressing, and don't think are worth caring much about. We see modernist buildings as consumer products, each with a case, screen, audio jack, and power supply. Although our colleagues thought it was a little strange in the beginning, we have worked to expand the narrow definition of modernist architecture into a more nuanced and enriched idiom through the comfortable blending of environmental, vernacular, historic, and modern design. And we celebrate architecture as much for its industrial achievements as for its embodiment of our collective experience. As we, serve, as we share a survey of some of our projects, keep in mind that architecture for us is not solely pragmatic. Architecture is both a practical service and an art form, and its unique nature is not a paradox. As a practical discipline, architecture creates physical space and form for people to inhabit, to rest, to work, to learn, to worship, to heal, and to gather. But architecture goes beyond the pragmatic to enrich human life through the expression of artistic ideas that are part of its practical requirements. The year 2021 marks our 40th anniversary of the first ever residential adaptation of a historic building in the United States. The Calendar School Historic Preservation and Adaptive Reuse Project was completed in 1981. The scope of services, which are commonplace today, introduced a hybrid intervention. The historic restoration of a vacant building in a historic district originally erected for a civic use and the adaptation of its interior for reuse as a multi-unit residential dwelling. The project is also noteworthy for the early uses of passive house design strategies. 2021 also marks the 35th anniversary of the living loft prototype for a new American apartment featured at the Milan Triennale in 1985. The installation introduced our ideas about apartment dwelling as a feasible response to revitalizing vacant post-industrial buildings by inserting new form into existing structures. This environmentally responsible urban development strategy has since helped to transform millions of square feet of built environment that grew out of sync with its time into qualitative space. Strategies developed for some time of our early adaptive reuse projects have also been applied to the successful design of small space. At George Rinaldi Architect, we believe in architectural equity and the idea that everyone is entitled to great architecture, not just the rich and famous. And although our interior architecture projects come in every shape and size, ranging from very large to quite small, the allure of the smallest residential and commercial projects has held strong for more than 40 years. We call these projects microspaces, and we think part of their charm has to do with how challenging it is to achieve high quality design. Another tiny project is uh, Huascar and Co. Bake Shop. It's a tiny bakery storefront 
with an equally tiny commercial kitchen behind it. Uh, the project was completed in 2018 for New York City's reigning Cupcake Wars champion. There were many physical constraints and an unusually small budget, but the transformation is astonishing. The outcome required perfect attention to details and a design that encouraged a sense of hand craftsmanship to both the exterior and the interior of the space. The redesign of a small apartment transformed uh, an old uh, fashioned floor plan into a coherent modern dwelling with an integrated ceiling fitted with high performance LED lighting that illuminates the dimly lit courtyard orientation. Another type of project influenced by adaptive reuse strategies is 8 Severn Road, Hong Kong, an architectural solution for a luxury residential development at the top of the peak, the highest point on Victoria Peak. The adaptation of old factory buildings into loft living dwellings became a vehicle for us to explore the integration of modernist ideas about transparency and dematerialization de with ideas about solidity and placemaking. The project was designed in the 1980s uh, and constructed over two phases in 2009 and 2016 by the developer Sun Hung Kai Limited. The site consists of 22 detached houses and two and three story freestanding houses, all with loft-like ceiling heights and open plan living and dining rooms. Clubhouse amenities feature spa facilities and an outdoor veranda surrounded by lush gardens. Landscape walkways double as a breezeway for residents to go from their apartments to their parking to their residential facility, their recreational facility. Water features serve as another unifying element and a cooling counterpoint to summer sun. The massing establish a grand, establishes a grand feeling of in the open air space and harbor views and the early use of an infinity swimming pool. The project is considered an architectural landmark exemplifying the aesthetic quality and compatibility with forms of the city of Hong Kong and its relationship with the natural environment and the commanding views of sky, sea, and green hills. Since 2012, Severn Road has been listed as one of the 10 most expensive residential properties per square foot on the planet, right up there with Via Soretta in San Moritz and Kensington Palace Gardens in London and Fifth Avenue, New York. Drawing has, uh, has been an important part of our working process. Um, the evolution of architectural drawing through time has allowed uh, for the development of the, uh, the origins of the idea captured in the sketch, as you can see in the sketches above. And of course, in the development drawings, uh, as successive ideas are worked out uh, in detail through stonework, uh, cast terracotta, copper, and the final design uh, accounting for everything from window frames to cornices to uh, glazing. Um, uh, Saratoga Avenue Community Center is a, um, a project, a public project. The New York City Housing Authority about 10 years ago called for um, architecture and related services to renovate uh, the ground floor space of a public housing block and to add a 6,000 square foot addition with a multi-purpose space for 24 hour, seven day a week use and staff offices, a commercial kitchen, restroom, stock room, storage, and a ground level connection to the exterior tower, all for the rock bottom budget of $300 a square foot. Um, scrupulous attention to budgets and constructability guided the development of the design of the project, uh, which features elongated iron spot brick and mahogany wood frame windows and glass reinforced fiber concrete facade elements that were prefabricated offsite to help with the budget uh, to achieve a sustainable design excellence. Um, in the construction documentation and the specifications for the new building and the interior renovation were delivered on time and it became an award-winning pro project. Um, sounds so braggy. Very braggy. We're very it braggy. sounds so braggy. <laughs> uh, George Valley Architect performed master planning and schematic design phase services for the Pennsylvania Station Service Plant building for Amtrak. 
The program called for the major renovation of the interior of the existing structure, uh, the last remaining structure from the McKimney and White uh, Pennsylvania Station, measuring approximately 27,000 square feet to house the back office operations of Amtrak, New Jersey Transit, and Long Island Railroad, and architectural design to introduce a new addition on the vacant lot next door with an ADA accessible second story connection to the original building. Interior architectural design services for the existing building retain some of the original industrial features and transformed others, including the 55, the 50 foot high coal hopper adapted for reuse as a soaring atrium entrance and lobby with spaces for, for smaller and larger groups, including a 300 seat auditorium uh, the addition houses an 18-story hotel tower, measuring approximately 168,000 uh, plus square feet, with seamless connections to the sub-basement level of the old power station, measuring approximately 15,000 gross square feet for hotel amenity use. Architectural design services performed in 35 workdays met the stipulated conceptual design budget. And most importantly, it's a building which fits, we think, very beautifully with the historic building that it's directly adjacent to. So we're showing you this project because like the peak project that was designed in the 80s and constructed in the 2000s, this project uh, for the Times Tower in, in this iconic setting in New York City was designed in the 80s and we're still in dialogue with the owners of the property and we're very hopeful <laughs> that someday it will actually be realized. So um, in uh, 1983, the Municipal Art Society uh, was trying to galvanize efforts of artists and architects and civic leaders on behalf of New York City's public spaces. And um, they were campaigning against this massive proposal to sort of wipe away the historic fabric of Times Square and start from scratch. Uh, and we felt that the crossroads of the world uh, deserved maybe a, an update, a refresher, um, but we didn't uh, think it was a good idea that all of the historic theaters were vanishing. Um, so we designed, uh, we contributed a, a concept design for the Times Tower, uh, also known as One Times Square or the New York Times building uh, that aimed to create the impression of this timeless vertical building with, with iconic dimensions um, and also some pragmatic functions. The design achieved uh, uh, the renovation of the 42nd Street subway station, serving many, many subway lines. And the concept design proposes an enlarged ground floor lobby space over the enlarged 42nd Street subway station and above the entrance, a distinctive sphere shaped uh, uh, improvisational space for an arena theater for an arena theater with uh, with the stage placed slightly over the audience. The design suits uh, the popular high energy performances and classical stage productions equally. The sphere joins to upper level floors, providing space for rehearsal and production screenings, gallery exhibitions, and education facilities. And at the top of the building. Can we go back? Go back. At the top of the building, uh, the two wing-like projections cantilevered from the faceted shaft, each offer space for a traditional proscenium, the proscenium theater. And the interior design included state-of-the-art stage design with uh, flexible arch and a main and rear stage orchestra pit and doctor stage loading. So uh, we are continuing to promote this project for Times Square. And as I said, we, we have engaged the owners of the building who, who are interested and, um, and we hope that the design will eventually become realized to reflect the architectural resonance with its historic context and to continue to build a positive civic identity for the city of New York. The Italian American Museum of New York complex circa 1905 located in the Chinatown Little Italy History, Historic District, Borough of Manhattan, commissioned architectural design services for the transformation of four row houses, each measuring 
uh, 40 feet high uh, uh, to, into a unified museum facility. Architecture Services incorporated the redesign of existing facades and upgrades to building systems serving 12 upper floor dwelling units and the design for a new entrance and lobby at the ground level, formerly Banco Stavoli, 1882 to 1932, as well as the design for a new restaurant with frontage on Mulberry Street. The design process incorporated a capital and operations analysis and the comprehensive assessment of existing conditions of the exterior envelope and all interior spaces, as well as energy modeling and the scope of services included design for new energy efficient ex exterior and interior lighting, signage, and, uh, and energy retrofits to building systems to achieve key sustainability objectives and to drive broader buy-in, reduce energy use and water use and improve quality. As you can see, the project also included uh, curatorial work. Here you see Dr. V in the bottom with uh, Professor Joseph Schelsa, the director of the Italian American Museum going over some of the archive material and some of the treasures that were that the, the museum has been the repository from the Italian American immigration into the United States. So we thought we'd show you a few of our projects that we have on the boards right now. This is a project, um, this was the winning submission to a New York City Parks uh, Department uh, call for proposals. Uh, we, we submitted a joint proposal with a, uh, with a hospitality company to establish the first um, commissary in Morningside Park. Morningside Park uh, is a beautiful narrow park on, uh, in Upper Manhattan that was designed by Olmsted and Vaux, the same people who designed Central Park and many other beautiful parks and civic uh, sites throughout the country. Uh, and we thought this would be a phenomenal opportunity to um, advance our core value uh, for architectural inclusion because uh, Morningside Park has never had a commissary, which I find, we find very striking um, given that all the parks have amenities for park users. Uh, so this um, project proposes a, um, a net zero or net plus kiosk, food kiosk on the site of um, an old park service building, um, a historic building, uh, using the roof of the building as an outdoor terrace and a site, the site for the kiosk and the space below as a commercial kitchen and uh, storage facility. And so uh, there's are some other views of the food kiosk. The solar panels will sit in the top and collect all of the energy that the kiosk needs to function and more. Um, and then in the back, which you can't see in any of these views is um, a rainwater harvesting system so that the, the uh, planted patio will not tax the city's uh, water infrastructure and the, the, and it will, the plantings, the planting beds and pots will be serviced by the rainwater collected by the, um, by the kiosk. Uh, this is a project. Aging in place, right? This is aging in place. Aging yeah. in place uh, project. Uh, uh, the client had uh, had commissioned us to add a uh, a lift for an aging parent uh, who would be able to move uh, in the building as freely as possible. You can see pictured on the slide on the left the existing building. Um, with uh, uh, with some egress stairs uh, coming from upper floors and a, a terrace off the second floor, uh, we added the uh, lift to the right side of the of the building, uh, uh, which would serve all floors, including the roof, uh, from a new terrace uh, at the ground level, a new second floor terrace with new balcony balustrades and railings. And uh, this was uh, uh, built on top of an existing uh, entryway uh, and a very small space. Uh, and everything had to be brought into the building through a uh, three foot wide, uh, uh, three foot wide hallway. So all the building materials, everything had to be designed uh, in segments to be, to be brought in in pieces and feel directed on the backside. It's uh, in a very delicate, 
set of GFRC panels with raised and incised uh, detailing uh, to make a more positive contribution to the, to the uh, garden and buildings that surround the structure. Um, we also uh, were commissioned to do some interior uh, renovation work uh, and furniture here. One of our dining tables uh, pictured on the upper slide, one of our club chairs and one of our custom carpets uh, on the, on the, uh, in the dining area. And down below uh, was to convert uh, part of a sitting room into a uh, bedroom uh, with sliding uh, glass and wood doors and of course, we always include artwork as part of our uh, projects. Uh, this painting by one of our by one of our distinguished colleagues, uh, Mr. Iwa. So this is also a new project that we're working on. It's um it's a museum building. It's for a museum building in Pennsylvania, and um, it's um it's a a service bar off of a room where people come to hear music. And it, um, we decided to propose to the owner, uh, the owners of the building and the director of the museum, the idea of uh, taking a mezzanine space that exists and cladding it with panels that can be used as a projection space to show artwork. Uh, at, when, when the museum's programming saw fit to do that, and then to be an opaque uh, uh, cladding for, for other times to just sort of expand the use of the space into um, a gallery space of sorts, uh, as well as a, a service bar space. So the service bar is below and the projection space is above and the storage area is behind. You can see the layout in the section there. So the other piece of our practice that we wanted to share with you is, um, is uh, some of our furniture portfolio. You know, we're a creative design firm and although we strive to be creative, we are also highly rational about the process. Over the years, we've continued to make room for improvements in our approach and we've made significant strides, for example, in the integration of ergonomic research into our furniture design. The uh, Festa Credenza, for example, is the result of a thoughtfully balanced collaboration between science and design with the objective of rendering the recognizable form of the common credenza cabinet unknowable enough to open up interest Dr. V's research is drawn from the field of ergonomics and the architectural inspiration is the wonder camera, the cabinet of wonders, which was all the rage in 17th century Europe and a metaphor for the art of life. Each drawer of the cabinet promised something interesting and, inst and instructive and beautiful. So Festa Credenza is a modern reboot of the traditional Credenza style cabinet, typically found in a dining room. Uh, with sliding doors that open up to storage for tableware. The design history of the credenza is a case study in grids. For pragmatic reasons, cubes with straight lines and right angles recur to reduce the complexity of fabrication. The receptacle itself follows the transparent logic of a grid. Fester credenza eschews the simple rectilinear form. A central element is flanked by two cantilevered wings and the compositional arrangement of the one to two geometry echoes, the we think, the dynamic form of a bird in flight, like a golden eagle measuring about 30 inches in width with a wingspan of 70 inches. Festa Credenza is unbounded by traditional use. It inhabits every corner of every kind of space that we could think of. Um, and it's not exactly minimalist. The design offsets the formal rigor uh, with irregularities to bring about the shifting of perspectives. Cutouts, surface finishes, and joinery um, are discoverable at different angles, shelter moods and emotions, adopting an inimitable presence that brings to life these abstract creatures, embodying layers and layers of cultural and personal histories. 
Artfully arranged, sliding drawers offer up to 12 cubic feet of storage. Two trimless flat panel doors accommodate options to potentially eliminate sliding drawers and create a larger central storage container for everything from retractable digital display monitors and projection equipment to many other types of larger devices and objects. The trimless doors virtually disappear into their surroundings, creating an elegant appearance. To successfully pull this off, all surfaces inside and outside are clad with the same material and door hinges are hidden out of sight, uh, which, is where, which is where manufactured concealed hinge systems come into play. Notches eliminate the need for hardware while allowing doors and sliding drawers to operate as good as they look. So um, another uh, furniture project, long-term furniture project of ours is the design of chairs. Um, we began designing chairs in 1985. We introduced a chair in, uh, at the Milan Triennale with our living loft project, um, which became known as Valentine One. It's a black lacquer and brass chair that's in the Promisadia collection in Udine. Um, and it's a chair that we've continued to tinker with and tweak and make in many different finishes and combined materials uh, today, till today. It's um, currently being represented by an art gallery and we get all kinds of requests for uh, variations on this chair. Um, the Valentine II chair is I think our, uh, the chair we're very, uh, very, we're very proud of. Uh, it's in the permanent collection at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And it's, um, it's a series of planes that are interconnected and it's made out of solid surface material. Um, and no one has asked for a variation on this chair to date. They just like it the way it is. Um, Valentine three chair is our ergonomic victory. Uh, it took us 35 years uh, and we think we've finally achieved the design for the fanciest, most comfortable dining chair. Uh, we've tested this chair on hundreds of people uh, of all shapes and sizes from every kind of background who uh, fall in love with it as soon as they sit in it. Not so much when they see it, but when they sit in it. Um, and it, it's, uh, it, has a, it, it doesn't have a straight back. It has a uh, rounded back that gives lumbar support at the bottom and a very, very comfortably cushioned um, uh, seat, uh, seat cushion. And the spread of the legs and the proportion and the thickness of them, we think we've finally got it right after many, many tries. Uh, we've worked in all different kinds of, of uh, materials for furniture in this set of furnitures that were originally designed in the 1980s. This is a recent, uh, update to that, to those chairs. These are fabricated in sheet steel. Um, uh, we were the first uh, architecture firm to try to domesticate uh, <laughs> sheet steel uh, from, from auto body uh, chassis design to, to architectural interiors. Uh, no one had done it at that point. One, uh, one architectural historian told us at one point that we were responsible for housebreaking sheet steel. Um, so Very these fair. are, these are, uh, bent and flame cut and welded together. And then uh, they come in a variety of finishes, uh, either lacquer covered on the original fabrication process, which you can see the roughening of the steel or in a blackened steel, which is a, um, a chemical process where the steel is, is turned into a very soft uh, uh, charcoal black matte finish. Uh, this one outfitted with uh, very comfortable leather cushions. That, that was supposed to, this, this, this was slide supposed was supposed to, to be oh, with oh. the earlier slide. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> to show other variations of the credenza cabinet. So. <clears throat> and th there's, there are, there are many variations. I guess they're all here. <laughs> they're all here. They got slid out they of got, the they, they, Sorry about they, that. They, they, they snuck down. Oh, and here's another one. <laughs> this one's ebony uh, plywood veneer. Veneers are great. We love veneers. Uh, veneer is another one of those things that we started doing because we thought, wow, veneers are great because you can you can use a base of hard growing wood and put an exotic wood 
over it and never waste a piece of wood because the veneers are, are, are incredibly easy to manipulate and finish with. And you don't ever waste any wood. You never have any ex extra wood. So we started using veneers and people said, oh, veneers, that, that's, you know, that's not elegant and that's not, um, that's not anything that we would consider the finer grain of design. And we did some research and we found out that veneer, the use of veneer woods goes back to, you know, the ancient Egyptian uh, uh, dynasties and that perception of veneers was just not correct or not um, accurate. So we continue to promote veneers. And as, as we've worked with veneers, we've also um, developed some strategies to apply them using UV light so that they don't give off VOCs to protect the fabricators from toxins. Uh, and they, they've been, it's just been a very, very satisfying material to work with. Uh, this is one of our other club chairs. Uh, this one made in, also in, in veneered plywood. Um, and uh, this one, very, very soft, comfortable, soft leather cushions. Because they're recycled. Because they're recycled. <laughs> so we've, we've also designed a bunch of dining tables, some of them using uh, very sumptuous, lush... Um, Onyx. Uh, uh, tabletops like this one, which is made of onyx, paired with uh, very rough and tumble material for the base, like um, sheet steel, um, which makes a very curious and interesting combination. And those are the, and our Valentine one chairs. And uh, sometimes the base is a very fancy as well, like this table where the base is um, machine, machine granite. granite and the, the uh, tabletop is marble. And that concludes our presentation. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, do you want to uh, stop sharing and we can uh, have a sure. conversation? Sure. Sure. I was going to ask you right off. Do you, is the design of your furniture uh, do you, does that coincide with how you, what you're thinking of in terms of your other architecture projects? There, there are definitely developments of the larger ideas, but um, they also are unlike the architecture, which has much larger parameters uh, uh, and organizational principles. The furniture is very intimate and it's, it's connected to ergonomics. It's connected to utility and materials. We started designing furniture for our residential clients and our, and our commercial office clients uh, so who would have a space, uh, you know, and it, it, with, with certain constraints, you know, like the amount of space that they had and they wanted to renovate. And they would say, well, we can't find the right table or we can't find the right desk or the right chairs. And so we would offer to design a chair or table to, to potentially include in the, in the architecture project. And then we noticed that um, over the first 10 years of doing that, certain designs continue to be re-requested by clients. And they would walk, they would look through a portfolio of a work and say, oh, that's a really great chair. That's a really great table, or that's a really great bed. Um, we've designed, for example, a bed for grown-ups that has door, has drawers underneath that you can't see, you know, because it's they're because of the visual angle that they're pitched at, you can't really see them. So they don't, it looks like a very elegant grown-up bed but there's four storage drawers underneath. And people who live in small spaces find, you know, that finds that very prime real estate, you know, drawers underneath their bed uh, to store their linens, linens and whatnot. And so what we did was we took the pieces that seemed to be of interest to people and we continued to refine them and revise them and, you know, just sort of labor lovingly over them over, over many, many years. And, um, they continue to be the pieces that people want. <laughs> I was fascinated before we got started, you mentioned your interest in neuroscience and design. Could you talk a little bit about uh, how that's influenced your work and what you've learned about the, how the brain reacts with space and design? Well, you know, um, my, training, my training in psychology is, uh, is is in seven different uh, practice areas. One of them is environmental design. 
And environmental design is the study of the impact of naturally natural space and constructed space, built space on humans, on the human condition. When I was when I trained uh, 30, 40 years ago, there was not a lot of neurological research on the brain. There was behavioral research on observed reactions to the impact of space on everything from moods to attention and learning to uh, hyperact, you know, level of activity, hyperactivity in children. Um, but now, because of the fMRI technology, we can wire uh, research subjects up to a machine and put them in a virtual space that uh, get, cues the brain in the same way that a real space does. And we can study about uh, the impact of natural light and materials and volume and um, and spatial, other spatial conditions on the human brain. Some of the most recent research that I find fascinating is, that seal, is in the area of ceiling height. There was a research study done on a prison population. Uh, some of the prisoners were in uh, cells that had a conventional eight foot high ceiling. Others were in uh, cells that had higher ceilings than that. And those prisoners who were in, uh, incarcerated in cells with higher than an average height ceiling reported thinking about freedom more than those in the conventional height cell. So, you know, spatial conditions and architecture and design are, are is incredibly relevant to human psychology, human responses, uh, human uh, well-being, uh, and human detriment. Um, uh, there, there isn't a project that we work on. And at this point, after all these years in practice, we've worked on every type of project uh, under the sun. There isn't a project that we've worked on that, that where, where I don't find research, some research to help inform our design decisions at this point. And, uh, and it's only going to be better and better as time goes on. I came to the subject obviously as a, as a novice and through, uh, and through more the, the um, trying to understand better uh, the things I observed empirically uh, about buildings and about people's behavior in buildings. I was very curious, you know, as I, as I uh, finished my architectural training and started to travel, that I would go to places to see buildings and, and uh, people took photographs uh, with their friends and their families in front of buildings. In front and of iconic buildings. In right. front of iconic buildings in particular and came to think that maybe there was a connection between memory and experience and uh, and uh, and special events and how that fusion took place, and that was one of our early uh, my early conversations with Dr. V about uh, about what relationship architecture held both on the exterior buildings, but even more importantly on the interior, where people's history and their lived experience became fused. With the, with the architecture of their environment. So that the, the necessity for the room and of course the furniture, the, the dining table became very important as the place where the family met, the family celebrated its day-to-day -day experiences, but also their uh, more ceremonial experiences. And so all of it became uh, the design of objects which could also help uh, hold those memories and those emotional Resonances, which were, uh, which I thought were were uh, were of interest, and of course, through our work together and conversations, became much more clear to me about how those things are, uh, how, how they actually work <laughs> psychologically. Thank you. There's a uh, few questions I posted. One, one is from uh, Jim, who writes, "Does your commitment to architecture equity?" translate into pro bono work for public projects in low income housing, for example? Yes, so we have a we have a, a we have a community uh, partners initiative that we've run for a very long time, uh, more than 15 years, where we allocate 20% of our uh, gross annual billing to pro bono and reduced fee work for um, clients and projects that are historically underrepresented under underrepresented communities. Uh, and we have successfully managed um, uh, our economic model to accommodate that um, for a very long time. We also have two training programs that target um, underrepresented 
people in the field of architecture. Um, one of them is has been funded for uh, I think six or seven cycles by a grant uh, by the city council, and the other one is self-funded. We we fund it, um, and that is to train high school students and recent college graduates, uh, and train and mentor them in architecture. And these are uh, historically underrepresented people, namely women and uh, people of color. I think as, as was mentioned in the, in the um, uh, introduction to our talk, the building pictured behind us, uh, we, consider, uh, we consider one of our most important projects. It's a, it's a community center in Brooklyn. It's for an underrepresented community. Um, and the, the impact the building has had on the local community uh, has been substantial. Uh, people use the building for a whole host of activities during the day from daycare to senior centers. And more importantly, on weekends, the building is, is used to host family uh, parties for birthdays, weddings, uh, and other- And it's part of a public housing complex. It's part of a public housing complex. Whenever we can, we apply for public work. Um, it, it's very bureaucratically, very challenging. Um, and it's often, irrational, the selection process is often irrational, but we, um, our marketing uh, initiatives always target uh, public work. Thank you, Penny has a question for you. Yes, hi, uh, mine's a little bit more nuts and bolts. Um, as Thomas and Patty know, I'm an ex uh, photographer, architecture, it was my specialty. Um, and I loved your loft, stuff when you were talking about lofts and how you redo them um my studio used to be in the yale law the yale lock building in stanford oh yeah uh -huh. and yeah. i was a yale loft artist and commercial photographer there and my question is do you prefer to get a building that needs to be sort of reimagined and redone or do you prefer a blank slate to build lofts do you know what I'm saying? Does, would you want it from the beginning or would you want to repurpose? Well, I, you know, we've done it both ways. We've done it, we've done it both ways. And I'd like to say the, that we, we take credit for the, pretty much for the loft movement. Um, from the very first project we did for the calendar school and many, many loft projects thereafter, which were, which were uh, published all over the world, um, those projects which started out to be uh, just to figure out a way for people to inhabit the, the found condition of the loft, which in New York City was, was very inexpensive residential space at that time in the, in the mid 1970s. Uh, it was space that nobody wanted. And, and it as, was early live work. And it was very early live workspace. It was motive, mostly artists and residents in New York City. Uh, you had to be an artist in residence to occupy those spaces. Uh, and to find an unconventional and yet conventional way of providing a, a domestic quarters for, for people with their kids and families and their artistic endeavors uh, was a real challenge. And, and it spawned a movement. It spawned a worldwide movement uh, to build lofts that have popped up in Spain, in Italy, in Japan, and all over the world. And- um, so, so the way the process unraveled. I mean, it wasn't really our preference. It was what it was just what happened. Um, we, we, uh, there were a lot of post industrial buildings that were being uh, people wanted to convert into lofts. And um, initially, people were moving into them, and they didn't have any dividing walls. And, you know, you'd go into someone's loft and the bedroom would be out in the middle of a big room where the kitchen and everything else was. And I thought to people to, I remember uh, mentioning to my partner, this is going to be, this is going to cause a lot of trouble in families. Like there are no relatively private spaces where people can go and debrief and, and <laughs> unwind and, and meditate and, and reconstitute themselves. And, um, and I remember about in the, in the late 80s, there was a, an article in the New York Times that referenced a, a research study to show that the divorce rate was higher among couples who lived in lofts. And so at that time, when we did the uh, Milan Triennale project, we were thinking about all of this, how to domesticate 
in space that was a bit originally built for industrial use. We weren't thinking, how can we build new construction? Because at that time there was a recession and there was no new construction. So we were responding to the economic conditions and the needs that people had. And so uh, uh, George devised a very ingenious strategy called, what we, which we call for shorthands now the insertion strategy, uh, inserting three-dimensional form into the host structure of the existing loft building that could be inhabited, used as bedrooms and bathrooms and offices and studies and other and and studios and other private spaces, uh, and then the shell the uh, host structure and this inserted form in between those two spaces became sort of the common the common courtyard interior courtyard for the loft where the living and the dining took place. The well, communal we, space, and so that's so that so those design features and those design realities then began to influence new construction. So what I saw happen was the design teams in the office were working on those adaptation projects to convert industrial lofts into dwellings, residential dwellings, and then as you know, in the early nineties, the economy was in a different place and new construction was beginning to d d gain momentum the designers were beginning to take those features of the existing industrial buildings and the insertions and creating new construction using higher ceilings, mm -hmm. uh, multi-level spaces, uh, spaces that were not just a box cut up into boxes within boxes, but had perspectives and views and um, you know, changing light, large windows. And, um, and so I saw that there was an influence, a pattern of influencing the, con the new construction. And I think you can see in the in the uh, uh, peak project in Severn Road that 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 mechanism appeals to uh, to people of people who want to inhabit those kinds of sites and, and in those landscapes as well. It's it was literally building a loft on top of a mountain, uh, wow. but which also had a historic presence in a in a landscape that was quite dramatic and had quite a historical presence. So oh, well, that's great. I, uh, Thomas, can I just slip in one more quick sure. question? Yes. Uh, I did notice on your site, I didn't realize that you did the Paris Opera. And I take people to photo Yeah, I take people to photograph Pelle Garnier. So my question is, did the original Garnier architecture and design, did it have a, a huge influence on what you did with the Paris Opera, the new building, or were you like breaking away totally? No, actually one of the things that fascinated me about the Garnier Opera uh, as, as I uh, began working on the project were the, were the issues that surrounded the design of the original building in terms of how it manifested social systems and social structures mm -hmm. and and uh, the staircases, for example, and the way they were positioned in the entry halls and movement systems through the building were not only about uh, uh, just moving people in and out of, the, out of the opera theater, but also it was about being seen. There was a certain performative quality to the, to the design of that immersive. space. <laughs> it was immersive, certainly. Uh, and also it was about the representation of the class structure within France at that period. So our, our submission for that project actually uh, went back into, um, uh, into the enlightenment, uh, some of the enlightened treatise on theater design. We had a, we did not have uh, boxes and social positions. We had actually a, a, a semi-spherical uh, seating arrangement in which everyone had an equidistant position from the stage, um, the front of the building, had the box seats projecting out of the enclosure to the structure, which of course are the cheapest seats in the opera as some of the more demonstrative elements in the architecture. We had large enfilades of space that ran down side streets. And of course, more importantly, uh, our submission uh, was the, I think one of the only submissions that did not include demolishing any historic, any of the existing buildings on the site. We also proposed an opera to the theater for the summer months in the Place de la Bastille. So, and we introduced a new subway line and so that there was line, public we, transportation to the site. It was a new station. We actually found a, a subway line running uh, at that piece oh, right. of, the, that uh, station. Uh, of the Seine, uh, the River Seine at that point.
Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. What are some of the main influences for your design elements and your interesting shapes that you come up with? Geometry. <laughs> uh, well, there, there, some of it looks a little Native American, Art Deco, yes. Taliesin. Yes. It's kind of an interesting blend of a lot of different things. Um, obviously, I, I, I was a, a, a very good student of history. I, I enjoyed looking at a lot of different uh, architectures, different cultures, uh, different influences. Uh, and, you know, it's a, it's a I, I was very lucky to have been taught by a, a historian, Sybil Mahalinaj, who was a really terrific historian. And she often taught us about the specificity of place and that architecture is fabricated out of, out of a couple of basic criteria. One is the atmosphere and feeling of a place, which can only be gathered by being there and kind of soaking that soaking that experience in. The second is, are the construction systems of your time uh, and, and how they impact uh, in the design process. And then of course, budget and money. Uh, it's a very small uh, formula. And I found myself, given the budgets we had at the time we started out and, and the ideas we were exploring, that uh, the, budget, the materials were pretty much uh, available in sheet stock. I started to begin to experiment with ornament and decoration in flat stock material and how that could be enhanced and, and developed into a much more uh, lively, uh, spirited uh, idea of architecture that wasn't uh, just banal and plain. I started working in, in, uh, in joinery processes in different materials. And as projects went on, I, I brought in more and more different materials uh, that work together, uh, whether it was raw steel and onyx or uh, the building behind you in masonry, casting stone and mahogany, uh, but to really look at the ornament process as part of the building. And that became part of our thesis of revisiting modernism, that modernism didn't really, had let all of that go. And I thought that there was uh, another way to interpret that into a contemporary idiom. And it really also is um, carried forward by our uh, by our, uh, the guidance of the idea of inclusion. So in our view, there's, there are only two kinds of architecture, good and bad architecture. There's every style of architecture, every culture, every culture at every point in history produces great architecture. So for example, we were commissioned, uh, our first uh, industrial design commission was to design door hardware for a company based in Japan. And we started looking at uh, Japanese symbol systems of representation and architecture. And we became fascinated by the use of the circle door, you know, to enter a Shinto shrine and the, you know, even the, the uh, symbol of the, the sun on the flag of Japan and, um, and the meaning of, you know, uh, the, the positive and um, enthusiastic and optimistic meaning of the, the circle. And so we included, we decided to include it in uh, in the on the face of the door hardware that we were designing all three pieces in different ways because it represented this uh, threshold and this transitional experience that we wanted to infuse with this cultural symbol of you know happiness and optimism. So and we and everywhere we go and every place that we work in and and every culture that we explore, you know, we find inspiration. And then we find ways to, and what, by we, I mean the designers and George and the other designers, find ways of integrating that, those, um, those influences. That's great. Uh, Jim has another question. He wrote, how have your projects been impacted by COVID? And are, you trying, and are you trying to find more resources and materials in the United States to mitigate the reliance of foreign manufacturers? Well, we always, we always use local materials as much as we can. We always, we always use local and we usually end up always using local uh, materials and, and, um, and recycled materials. Uh, but we also use a strategy called super use, which is we try to use as much of the materials at the site of the project as possible. 
Um, but COVID has had a very influ interesting influence on our practice. We, um, we went remote first entirely about two years before the quarantine in New York. You know, we, we mentor, we have, we have apprentices and we mentor and train many young architects and some of them have worked with us for decades. So beginning as far back as when the fax machine <laughs> became, uh, you know, uh, uh, an accessible uh, a piece of equipment to use in an office and people wanted to move to Nashville or uh, Boston or, you know, uh, California, we, we would start faxing drawings back and forth and uh, working that way. And then slowly over the years, we started to develop a, um, uh, an in-house project management software so that everybody involved in a project, all the affiliated subcontractors, the client and everyone can be in the same project folder from anywhere and in real time, get updated information, contribute updated information. Uh, and it would pull from every platform from the uh, computer assisted design programs, from the text messages, from the voicemail, from telephone uh, and uh, from the computer, from email. Um, and about two years ago, we finally got all of that straightened out and we asked the, the percentage of our remaining workforce if they wanted the option to go remote entirely and everyone said yes. So uh, we, you know, we have project meetings at building sites and we have in-person meetings so that people can stay in touch and everyone else was working remotely. So when the governor of New York state announced that the state was going on quarantine, we went to work the next day and there was no difference than the day before. Um, and all of our project con projects continued to run except the projects that were in construction and had to go on pause because of the mandate to stop all construction except emergency construction. Um, the other things that we, uh, the other thing that we did was we worked with um, a hospital system that was under siege and we helped them figure out how to um, devise improvisational temporary design interventions to route the doctors and the nurses and the staff in directions where they were crossing paths as little as possible. We uh, worked with the local police departments to close the streets to vehicles so that we could set up outdoor tents so that people could have meal time and break time in, in ways that actually were um, in accordance with social distancing guidelines. And we did all kinds of quick and dirty um, design interventions uh, with ventilation and um, when am, I, when am I forgetting anything? With ventilation, with food services, with food, with, with um, outdoor space, indoor space, and circulation to help protect uh, the hospital workforce from contracting COVID. And we did, in fact, help them reduce the infection rate. One hospital was teetering on collapsing, and we helped. We worked with the um, with the FEMA uh, emergency management team to. Um, to help prevent that from happening. We also designed a pro bono um, exhibition, a portraits exhibition uh, that was uh, created by a local artist, uh, <coughs> nurses. Um, and it's a traveling exhibition that's gonna go from hospital to hospital uh, for the next year and a half. And it's a beautiful, um, a beautiful tapestry of amazing nurses, um, everyone unique and yet all you know, part of this amazing uh, effort to care for COVID patients. Uh, related, related to this uh, question, if my dog lets me speak, <laughs> uh, you see the recent article on the Empire State Building and how uh, the tenants are moving out. There's kind of real concerns about the future of the building. Yes. That's think of that in, in terms of buildings in New York City and, and elsewhere, actually. It's very funny that the Empire State Building, uh, when it was finished in 1929, under, under record construction circumstances, the building is, has, has a history of not only being the tallest building in New York for decades, but also the building it was built under the most modern technology. It was built in 13 months from beginning to end. 
Uh, it was the first building ever to use a rotating workforce with cafeterias and hospitals on multiple floors during the construction of the, of the building. And when it opened in 1929, it was barely a third full and stayed that way for quite a long time. It was well into the late 1930s before the building was, was occupied more completely. And it's waxed and waned over the years. Uh, and I think commercial office space today in New York City and in other major cities around the country built. and and throughout the world is um, is facing um, you know a crisis of tenancy because people want people have worked at home companies have have advanced and and uh, maintained you know not just maintained the bottom line but advanced uh, uh, and and uh, it's it's a very attractive alternative for a lot of people. I think that there's going to have to be a very big reimagining of the use of that space. Um, we were we were asked by the um, by some local officials to uh, comment on proposals for to convert commercial office space to affordable housing. Unfortunately, given the shape and the massing of those buildings, that is not such an easy thing to do. You know, to begin to run. Uh, ventilation and utilities through a building that only has perimeter windows and a lot of air windowless space on the inside. You know, that's not the way residential buildings have been built. We- um, You're not allowed. Yeah, okay. Right. So we, we, um, we think that there's going to have to be a very radical reimagining of the paradigm of commercial office space moving forward, uh, because those spaces will not be as uh, full of the tenants that it, they had been full of for all this time. It'll be uh, interesting to see your own ideas in that regard. We we actually we're actually working on a few ideas um, for um, for community use spaces uh, and for um, we're very um, positive about vertical gardens in urban in urban centers and we worked um, with uh, with Brooklyn's biggest uh, largest food pantry facility to help them expand their, uh, you know, their capacity. And so we, um, we think that there's a lot of potential for urban gardening in those buildings. That's, that's interesting. Interesting, yeah. Uh, well, thank you very much for uh, your time with us this evening. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank and thanks for much. everyone who came, came out to listen. Thank you for everyone who came and, and, and listened. And we really appreciate your questions and we're happy to have you all stay in touch we're um we're on social media and you can always email us and uh and we're happy to continue the dialogue that, that's great oh, that's great and we'll send you a link for next sunday's uh, uh evening Please do. Vision thank you so much thank, thank, thank you. you very much thank you it's our pleasure it's, it's our big pleasure thank you good night good night, good night. And, have, and have a great evening everyone you too